You couldn't breathe. My biggest fear is what state you'll be in and whether you'll survive. We couldn't really touch you for more than a few minutes. As you may have gathered there from the words of my mother, my first moments, days, and weeks in this world were not easy. I went from utter darkness, utter peace, in the dark belly of my mother, to a brightly lit hospital room, and a world of stress. You see, I was born two months early, from a due date in the first week of December, being born on the 6th of October. I had to spend five weeks in ICU, with little to no human contact whatsoever. I'm sure at least the mothers in the audience, and maybe even some of the fathers with a higher emotional intelligence, <laughs> will be able to attest to the fact that there is nothing more frightening than being separated from your newborn child. In fact, research from Stanford psychologist Ian Gottlieb suggests that early life stress has significant effects on brain development. A 2021 study found individuals who experienced early life stress to be at a significant risk of developing depression and various related mental illnesses. Additionally, work from Jacek Deviets, a molecular neuroscientist at the University of Michigan states, at birth, the brain is the most underdeveloped organ in our body. It takes up until our mid-twenties for our brains to fully mature. Any serious and prolonged adversity, such as a sudden, unexpected, and lasting separation from a caretaker, changes the structure of the developing brain. It damages the child's ability to process emotion and leaves scars that are profound and lifelong. It was either life or death for me. Survival, and joy to those around me, or the worst thing parents can experience having to bury their own child. Needless to say, I survived. I've always seen the world in black and white. From the endless political debates on TV, to the gender divides within sports. Even in my own experience, my life has always felt divided. I mean, how do you explain a 4.0 GPA and a teacher's pet reputation with the contrast of my often invisible home life containing frequent shouting matches, broken mugs and cutting boards, and worst of all, a devastated mother? being forced to witness her son and husband constantly at odds with, odds with each other over the most trivial of things. I felt, so often, like two different selves. Recently, I remembered a concept I came across in the 11th grade artist collective, multiplicity, or more specifically, multiplicity of the self. Multiplicity of the self refers to people who behave as if they have at least two distinct selves, which are believed to be socially constructed. My awareness of this concept as well as understanding the sheer magnitude of how many factors shape our sense of self, allowed me to analyze myself in a far more objective manner. After all, this is something everyone experiences on some level, from how you interact with your peers, your closest friends, at work, or around complete strangers can be supremely inconsistent, whether you realize it or not. Now let's take a step back to the spring of 2020. The novel coronavirus pandemic was a transient time for self-identity. For some, it was an incredibly insightful time to step back and reflect on what was important. For others, it became a bad habit factory of Netflix all-nighters, binge eating, and endless scrolling through social media. I kind of went through both of those phases, and one moment stands out in particular as a turning point for me. Picture the scene. It's 4 a.m., and I'm sitting on the, on, the on the couch with an ear-splitting headache. I struggle to force myself up and walk to bed. Already feeling a looming sense of dread, I decided to check my phone screen time from the previous day. 17 hours and 56 minutes. Practically every waking moment of my day had been spent staring into a brightly lit screen. I dozed off into the darkness. The next day, I went and checked my screen time from the past few weeks. And I was hit with a harsh truth. It hadn't been an anomaly. Throughout the first two months of COVID, I spent 12 to 18 hours on my phone every single day. I'm sure many had their vice and were relate on some level, although perhaps not to the extreme I encountered. I knew something had to change. The constant flickering of my phone screen and my vision as I closed my eyes, my life had become a numb blend in which the light had become the darkness. This is, what ha this is what happens when you see everything in black and white. Fortunately, I had the initiative to try something new, art. And my father had always said, you have a creative mindset, you should try painting. But what does he know? He's just an econ major. <laughs> I'll give him this one though, he'd been right. And from the moment I finished my first painting, I just knew that art was something that I wanted to do. I focused my attention on how colors work together, as opposed to always seeing the world around me in black and white. Over the last two years, I've tried and experimented with various media, from acrylic painting, to aerosols, and caustic art, to photography. My favorite form, however, is digital art, which allows me to have more precise control. I can make something look exactly the way I want, with minimal complications. 
All that I need are diverse and compelling ideas, and execution becomes far more satisfying. I've compiled a selection of my recent favorite works. Please enjoy. as an artist, I've had three mentors with a profound impact on my art, as well as me as a person. First is Pak Sean, someone extre- <laughs> Sean is someone who is extremely treasured by my class. His life story is one that is far too long, and maybe a little controversial to tell, but what I learned from Sean is invaluable. Sean taught me about the concept of multiplicity, which I previously mentioned, as well as the importance of the self, in relation to the many. He would also teach students about the disturbed lives of great artists, as well as educate us on colonization from the perspective of the colonized. What I'm getting at here is that Sean, more so than anyone in my life, taught me to think differently. He allowed me to always question everything, especially authority, which I'm sure my parents are absolutely delighted about. 
Up next is Fuck Schubert. Now, Schubert was someone I didn't know all too well when I took my first ever class with him during the period of online school. The class was about mindful drawing, and it was the first time I'd ever done drawing for a class. From the moment the first lesson was over, I knew I'd made the right choice. We were allowed to draw anything we wanted, and I think something that made me really comfortable was that Joubert was a metalhead. He was someone who could actually appreciate the irony of Ghost, a band about which the debate of whether they are actually metal will never end. I was allowed to make drawings of metal album covers and other things that I liked, as opposed to drawing something boring that was assigned to me, which allowed me to enjoy drawing and take pride in it for the first time. This positive experience of being taught by Puck Schubert encouraged me to sign up for an outside-of-school art class with him a few months later. Those of you that know me well will know that me trying something new is the equivalent of a minor miracle. <laughs> this class had some lesson plans, and we learned about things such as composition, form, or pattern. What I really got out of the class was a sense of freedom. The vast majority of the time I spent in the class, I was allowed to work on projects entirely of my own choosing, with assistance available with guidance available if and when I asked for it. This taught me to value freedom and go, conf go confident in my artwork, as well as taking responsibility for my own learning. Last, but most certainly not least, is Eva Robin. <laughs> Eva Robin is someone I've only known for a year, but I can't think of anyone who would have been a better mentor for this process. The level of professionalism that she brings with her is unlike anyone I can remember. I ended up taking four of her advanced art classes over the course of grade 12, among which I tackled perhaps the biggest weakness in my artistic arsenal, figure drawing. No, I will not be sharing any of the work from that class. I think I have ways to go in that department. Although I am exceedingly thankful to her for creating a safe space for me to tackle this art form. This brings me to the most valuable concept she taught me about this year, liminal spaces. The word liminal comes from the Latin word limen, which means threshold. To be in a liminal space means to be on the precipice of something new, but not quite there yet. It is a transition between states of being. One can be in a liminal space physically, emotionally, or metaphorically. Being in such a state can be extremely uncomfortable. You feel like you are floating around in a lethargic manner. For me, however, I found these states to be a source of great comfort and inspiration. Whenever I feel unsure about how things are going, I ground myself by creating art. I've created an installation, which you can see here, which is a liminal space in itself, but also takes you to three key states of me. You have a piece depicting the dark, traumatic way I entered into the world. You have another piece depicting the light and flamboyance, representing some of the aspects of life which I treasure the most. But finally, you have a third piece, the chaos, the in-between of the polarity, the space where I can thrive. These artworks are all a reflection of who I am in three completely different ways. For me, Liminality is the key to seeing in between the light and the dark. The discomfort and challenge liminality provides motivates me to create art to better understand myself. This pain, it is a glacier moving through you and carving out deep valleys and creating spectacular landscapes. John Grant, Glacier. Thank you. <laughs>